All right, so starting out um, based off a number of people we had. Today might be a little bit shorter, just depending on how many questions I get from you guys. I've got a couple things that I want to make sure I, I go over or mention. Um, since you kind of, those of you showed up, it'll be kind of, kind of nice, or those of you who watch the video after the fact, some nice little hints or, or tips for the, the exam. But I want to uh, show you a couple resources that I, I want to make sure everyone's uh, aware of. And I did mention this, that I would get one up there. Um, and this has been up since Wednesday, but I have the kind of more detailed answer key to practice exam B. So if we click on this, you can kind of see like I have the formulas and everything typed out as opposed to just having what, what the correct answer is. Uh, on the, I mentioned this as well, that these will be popping up this week, but I have been posting a lot of different videos. So our class on, on Monday, we worked through five through nine and 14 through 17 on practice exam A. Wednesday, the video I posted, some of you kind of zoomed in. We worked through 10 through 14 and then 18 through 20. And then I also on Tuesday kind of posted some of these practice exam B problems that I, it was basically, if we click on the description here, I don't want to hear myself talk. I, I kind of, we went through five through nine, one through four and four through 14 through 20. So most of the questions on the exam, except for 11 through 13, which I then posted yesterday as I kind of went, went through that. Um, make, so there's really any problem on the practice exam, you can really find somewhere in these videos. And the descriptions, you know, I try to kind of make the titles to kind of allude to what's in them. But notice like the description, I put them in the order that I covered them. So I started out with five, then we went through nine, then 14 through 20, then one through four. So it makes it a little bit easier if you kind of want to navigate and find specific problems, where to find those in these videos. So those are just some resources that are, are up there for us. Uh, the other thing that I was gonna mention is just some more specifics about the exam. So it's up there on Canvas now, it's available. Like I said, it would be available yesterday from five to the end of the day on, on Sunday. Once you start, you'll have an hour and 20 minutes to complete it. There's 17 multiple choice questions worth four points each. So that's 68 points. And then the two short answers have kind of multiple parts to them. Um, kind of maybe roughly equate to like six questions total. But those two short answers uh, are worth a total of 32 points. So make sure as you're working on, on the exam, you save an adequate amount of time for those short answers. In fact, if it was me, um, maybe I would start out with those only because any work that you get done there, you get partial credit and whereas the multiple choice, if, if time does become an issue, although I, I don't want to, you know, don't think for most people, hopefully it will be, um, at least you could kind of take a, take a stab or a guess at those multiple choice, whereas the short answer, you couldn't really necessarily like just take a, a quick random guess, right? But um, I don't, hopefully, like I guess I don't think time should be too much of an issue. It's longer, a little bit longer than if we would have done it um, on like a Tuesday, Thursday class, like hour, 15 minutes. So I think you should have adequate time uh, for those file upload short answer questions. Just upload your work however you did. So if you're doing this work by hand, make sure you're taking pictures. You can take pictures and upload them. Uh, you can do your work in Word and upload it. You can do some of your work in, in Excel if you want to and upload it. Right, Excel is one of the tools or resources you can use on this exam. Um, but that, you know, show as much work as possible for those short answer because the whole goal of having part of it short answers, I can give some partial credit for that, right? Multiple choice are just kind of, you know, whether or not you get it correct or not, you don't need to show any work for that. So don't, you know, worry about uploading any work for those two. It's just for those two final short answer questions, okay? Are there any other kind of questions about the specifics or, or more of the kind of mechanics of this, of this exam? Wait to see if I get anything from anybody on Zoom here. Okay. So, one thing that I wanted to make sure that we go, first of all, before I go through anything I want to say, are there any specific questions on a particular problem that you'd want to see worked through? You guys don't have specific ones. Anybody on Zoom have a specific problem they want a question on or want to see worked through? Okay, so I'll, uh, what I want to start out with. So what I want to start out with is let's go to practice exam B. Let's go back up here to this contingency table. Okay, actually, sorry, not practice exam B. Do I have it open? Practice exam A. Okay, so we'll go up to this contingency table that we had we worked with earlier this week. You know, we have these events of whether or not someone wants marijuana legalized and whether or not they're over 55. So one thing I could be asked 
let me switch this over to the dot cam. I have to wait a second. I want you guys to be able to see both these here. The, the, those of you who are here, be able to see up. There we go. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit. Oh. All right. So what if I'd ask you, for what's the probability someone is older than 55 or, no, sorry. <laughs> I did the same thing last class. Um, they want marijuana legalized, right? So I've got this union that I'm looking for, right? This or this, you know, some of the problems we worked through down here earlier this week, we we're looking for and, right? Intersections or conditional probabilities. But a question that we worked through in class and also was on some of the kind of the Excel stuff we did and the Excel assignment is what if I want this union of two events or this or this? So if I go to my formula sheet and I look up here, I've got the equation for which the kind of the addition rule, how I can find the union. Right? The union of two events is simply add up the probability of those two events, but then we would have double counted what's in both, so we had to subtract out the intersection. Okay? So what I could do is just basically think about this is my A, this is my B, and write this out in the context of my example. So this is the probability of being, right, I guess, older than 55 or greater than 55, plus the probability of the other event, which is that uh, they want marijuana legalized, and then minus, if I can write older than 55, and LM is equal to yes. Right? So I'm just writing that out in the context of my example, using that formula from the formula sheet. Now at this point, it's just a matter of using that contingency table to identify these three components, right? So what's the probability of someone's older than 55? 0.25. What's the probability somebody wants marijuana legalized? 0.66. What's the intersection of those two things? So they want marijuana legalized and they're older than 55? 0.14. So then it's just, you know, then it becomes a little bit kind of simple mass is getting that entered into our calculator, right? But it kind of started out, right? What if I asked you for the union? You could use that equation, write it out in the context of your example, and then you're just identifying those probabilities from the contingency table. Okay. Any questions on that one? Okay. All right. Um, what was something else I wanted to do? Oh. Another thing, I think I have it, maybe did I type it out here? So let's say I had something that was, you know, a problem that had this wording, right? So the positive relationship between income and education is stronger than the negative relationship between test scores and the hours of Netflix watched, right? So, what are kind of some possible correlation coefficients we could see for those, these two relationships, right? So kind of using this information, let's think about some of the, the properties of a correlation coefficient and what, what answers, if we had some multiple choice answers here, what might even just make sense for us, right? So the way we write this correlation coefficient is kind of using this row, right? Three letter row. So I'm gonna say, here's the correlation coefficient between income and education. And then here's the correlation coefficient between test scores and Netflix, right? Hours of Netflix watched. What's one of the properties of the correlation coefficient? So remember the whole reason we were creating this is so that we would have a unit, right? Instead of the covariance that was unitless, so we had a statistic that was unitless, that we could compare across different types of relationships, right? So one thing that we said about the correlation coefficient is that it has to be somewhere between negative one 
I guess it technically could be equal as well, N1. So one would represent the strongest positive relationship, negative one representing the strongest negative relationship between two variables. So, you know, if I see something here like 1.2, I know that can't be an answer for that correlation coefficient, right? It has to be within this range. So let's say that, you know, I saw something here, like maybe this is 0.6. The correlation coefficient between income and education is 0.6. Could this be a possible correlation coefficient between Netflix and test, Netflix watch and test scores? We are told that it was a negative relationship, so could it be negative 0.7? It could be, except if we go back, we were told that the positive relationship between in income and education is stronger than that between test scores and, and Netflix. So if it's stronger, that means it would have to be, this would have to be closer to one then this was to negative one. So this couldn't be a possible correlation coefficient if this one was true. So it would have to be something like negative 0.3 or negative 0.4, right? So the closer to one, right? We can think about it as a stronger relationship. So this one has to be closer to one than this is to negative one, based off the, you know, the, the problem, right? And they're both bounded by, they have to be somewhere between negative one and one. So just kind of reviewing those properties of the correlation coefficient and exactly what that's telling us. Okay. Oops, sorry, my hands in front of that. Any questions on, on that or anything related to those correlation coefficients? I'm okay with that one. Um, another thing that I think would be good to know is when we're looking at some binomial or Poisson distribution examples, there's something that pops up a lot that you could waste a lot of time on the exam, but I don't, you know, that's not my, not my goal. So let's say, I don't know, I was listening to, to, to UFO guy on Rogan earlier and um, he was saying, you know, we could think about like, what if there was like five UFO visits every year to the, to the United States or to the, to the world, right? So on average, we see five kind of alien visitations every year. What's the probability this year that we see at least one, right? So what's the probability we see at least one? Well, in order to find this, I would think about every outcome that fits this criteria. So the probability X is equal to one, plus the probability X is equal to two, plus all the way, where do I stop, right? With the Poisson distribution, right, technically we can just kind of keep going, right? We could see an infinite number of, of alien visitations, I guess, this year. So obviously, every time you're looking for a probability, you're, you're gonna have to use that probability mass function. I'm not expecting you to do this an infinite number of times. So one thing that becomes really important, and even if it's not infinite, right, even if it's a binomial example, and let's say that you would stop at five, well, I, I'm never gonna be expecting you to use that binomial math probability mass function or the Poisson probability mass function more than two times for any problem, right? So anytime you write something out and you've got like three or four outcomes, there's probably an easier way to solve it, okay? So if this we think about is event A, well, that's actually the same thing as one minus A complement, okay? So what would the complement of A be here? Well, if A is that X is greater than or equal to one, the complement is just that it's less than one, which, what's the only outcome that would fit this criteria? Well, one is not less than one, and the very next possible value we could see is zero. And zero is the lowest number of successes we could ever see. So, you know, then from here, um, we would just use that Poisson distribution equation, which I'll show you on the formula, sh formula sheet in a second, but it's uh, lambda to the X, E to the negative lambda over X factorial. Okay. So we'll plug in, and we want one minus, and then uh, so we'll go what lambda we had up here was five. So five to the zero power, e to the negative five over zero factorial, right? Just plugging in x of zero, 
and our lambda of five. So one thing to remember is anything that is zero power is gonna be what? Yeah, one. And then zero factorial, we said has this weird property where that's actually also one. So really here, all, all we really have to do is e to the negative fifth and then subtract that from one, right? But kind of, I just wanted to review like, this complement rule is gonna be really important in those binomial and Poisson distribution uh, problems. And then also I wanted to kind of just remind you that when you're looking for the probability that's equal to zero and you have things raised to the zero power, that's just one. And then zero factorial is also just one. And that would apply to kind of the binomial as well, right? We might end up with a zero factorial there or something to the zero power. So um, kind of rem you know, reminding you of those because I wrote the exam and you might see stuff like this. Okay. Any questions over, over this Poisson distribution? Okay. And, uh, you know, if I just kind of a reminder as you're kind of thinking about this formula sheet, we've got our Poisson distribution equation right here. And I think I was showing the other class, but you know, one thing that I had suggested and that you might start doing right, I had just type in kind of next to these equations, what they represent. That might be a good thing to do so that when you get to the exam, you kind of have the, everything kind of centrally located in one file. What you might also do is then start jotting things down underneath that. Like if you wanted to in the Word document or even on a separate piece of paper, it doesn't matter to type it out. You could write out your own like little cheat sheet, right? There's, I'm, I'm not prohibiting that. So if, if you got time, you might as well, well do that, kind of have everything in the same location. So one thing that I might write down in that cheat sheet is what's the difference between these Poisson distribution examples and this binomial, right? So what was the main way we said we could identify? Because I'm not going to necessarily tell you on the exam, like this in this binomial, just, you know, like you might have to recognize that you could apply the binomial distribution so what is a good way to determine what's binomial and what's a Poisson, right? In both of them, we're gonna be looking for like the number of successes or the probability that we see a certain number of successes. But what was the kind of the key defining kind of difference between those two? Does anyone, you guys remember or see if anybody in chat remembers either, but. So we're, we're looking for the probabilities in each one, right? So theoretically, you know, in both a Poisson and a binomial distribution example, I could be looking for the probability that I see five successes. We had two different probability mass functions, right? So the one that we just looked at with the Poisson had like lambda to the x, e to the negative lambda. And the binomial was what? n factorial over x factorial, n minus x, p to the x. I don't know, one minus P to the N minus X. So we've got two different equations, but when do we use each one of those, right? So anytime we're looking for a number of successes out of kind of N or a certain number of trials, or you can think about this as anytime we have a maximum number of successes that we could see, this is our binomial, right? So anytime there is a maximum number that we could see, that's my binomial. And then when I say there's a max number, not just like theoretically, but like that it's actually given to us. So, you know, if we think about here, I've got 15 people. If I wanna know what's the probability 10 of those 15 have a visual impairment, well, I'm, I'm, I could be, you know, I'm capped out at seeing 15 people, right? That's, that's the most I can see out of 15, right? Whereas when we have an example like this, where I'm looking at like the number of people by, struck by lightning in a year, or we go back to my, I don't know, alien visitations every year, right? That is looking for a certain number of successes over a time interval. Right? So it's not capped, right? I could theoretically see an infinite number of alien visitations. And so anytime I don't have like a maximum number of successes, or I'm just looking for, you know, looking over a time interval for the number of successes, probably a different number of successes. That's where I'm going to use the Poisson, right? So that might be something to kind of have written down kind of in front of you or good to have as you're going into the exam um, because, you know, we don't want to get confused about when we should use each of those, right? And that's the key difference, right? Where both of them are looking for the probability of different numbers of successes, but one of them 
you're kind of capped, right? There's a maximum you could see, or you're looking for this number of successes out of a number. For the Poisson, it's kind of open-ended, right? I, I mean, it's, there's a cap in the sense that I'm looking over a certain period of time, but, but you know, I don't know how many I could see over the next hour or over the next year or over the next week. I don't know where it would theoretically, you know, technically where it would end, okay? So that's kind of our difference between those two, right? And knowing when to apply which one of them, okay? Are there any other um, any questions on, on kind of that discussion or okay with that? Okay. Uh, I don't think we did this on this one, so let me. Or I don't think I did this with you guys. I we never really reviewed these problems. I'll just go over some quick things. Um, these are kind of some of the easier. I think they're a little bit easier. Uh, one through four on practice exam A, but you know, just some kind of tips and tricks to like not make any, you know, obvious mistakes. So here I've got what, five different UFC fighters. Um, what's the mean age of, of these fighters? So if I'm looking at their age, right? Which of these answers could I actually rule out right away? Before I, yeah. Yeah, right, before I even go to the formula, I can rule A and B out because if I look at this age, Remember, mean, medium mode, they're all a measure of where the center of this data is. How can the center of my age be values that are greater than the oldest person in that data set, right? You know, I, how can the, the middle point of the data be 43 when the maximum is only 41? So right away, we know that mean has to be somewhere between what? The maximum and the minimum, so 41 and 28. So C and D are the only ones that make sense there. Now, I think that one's, you know, pretty easy. Do you really need to identify the formula on the formula sheet? Probably not, but, but here it is, right? You're just adding up all those values, dividing by the number of numbers you have. So you would add up these five ages and then divide by five, right? You've got five different observations here. If I'm looking at this, I'm gonna guess it's 35, but it may not be. Um, so what, 32 plus 41 plus 37 plus 37 plus 28 over five. Yeah, it ends up being 35. Right? And you know, with a, with a data set this small, it comes a little bit easier. Like I really had no idea what that, but I, you can kind of eyeball like where, where the middle of that data is gonna be. Right? Yeah, so right, no matter if we're looking for a population or a sample mean, we're still dividing by the number of observations we have in the data set. Yep. What you're thinking about, and we'll kind of jump in the gun, but we'll go to that right now is, let's say I wanted to find a variance or a standard deviation, but I'm looking for a sample variance or a sample standard deviation. Now this is one of those where like, you know, I don't want you to, to calculate the mean wrong and then count. So I give you assume that the average height of these fighters is 71.6 or inches, I guess here. What's the sample standard deviation? Well. We go to our formula sheet. We've got our standard deviations here, which all this is telling us is the square root of the variance, right? In order to find the standard deviation, we first have to find the variance. So here's my population variance, where I divide by the number of observations. Here's my sample variance, which reminds me, you divide by the number of observations minus one. And what I do is I go through every observation, take its difference from the mean, right? Subtract the mean from it then square that value and then add them all up, right? So what I'd be doing here is going through each one. Go to the first observation, 69 minus 71.6, square that value. Maybe I don't wanna do this all in one long equation, so maybe I write that number down. Then 74 minus 71.6, square that value, write that number down. I do that for all five observations and then add them all up, right? That will give me the numerator, okay? Once I have that numerator, so I, I'll, I'll do it real quick so we can put a number to it. So let's say, uh, so what, 69 minus 71.6 squared plus 74 minus, is it 71.6? Yeah, squared plus 70, 71.6 squared plus 71.6 squared. The last one, 68. So our numerator, I think, should be, if I entered everything incorrect there in my calculator real fast, 33.2. So I just calculated the sum of all those deviations squared, and I get, let's say, 33.2. Okay. 
some more paper. I have some here. Should have had some. Should have had a bunch. So I had that numerator was. Thirty-three point two. I then need to be dividing it by n minus one because I had a sample, had sample data. So we had five observations. So thirty-three point two divided by five minus one, or thirty-three point two divided by four, should get eight point three, right? But then I select eight point three as my answer. Well, remember what did we find here? I was using the equation for the variance. There was one more step, right? which is if I want the standard deviation, I have to take the square root of the variance. So the square root of, what did I say this was, 8.3? Right. So I have one more step there to find the standard deviation. I take the square root of that and I end up with 2.88. Okay. So I kind of like didn't write down, I just kind of audio, uh, audibly said, Kind of how we found that numerator. But really the key here I want to point out is if you're looking for a sample standard deviation, we're dividing by n minus one. If it was a population, we would have just divided by n. And then to find that standard deviation, we have one more step, which was take the square root. Do you have a question? Yeah, so I'll identify whether or not the data, you know, maybe the problem might not have it quite as, as bolded here, right? So you pay very close attention to what it's asking, but there will be somewhere within the information given, like I'm identifying and trying to highlight, like it's a sample data or it's not, right? It's population data. Yep. If we want to find the median, right? So we want to find the median weight here. So we've got weight. Which of these answers can I rule out right away? Similar to the mean, the median is a measure of where the middle of the data is. So which of these answers don't make sense in problem two? Not A and, let's say A and D. Yeah, yeah, A and D, right? Because 73 and 71.6, well, that's less than the lowest weight I have here, right? That's less than 143. How can the middle part of the data be lower than the minimum, right? So right away, I know either or B or C is gonna make sense. Now, from there, I actually technically could figure out what it is here. Like, even if I didn't go through and calculate it, which one of these do I also know I can rule out? C, because in an odd number data set, my median has to be one of the values in the data set, right? So, because I'll be left with one middle value, right? If it was even, all bets are off because I'm gonna have to find the average of the last two that are left. So here, I automatically know right away it has to be 185, right? But if I gave you some more answers that made sense, right, what would we do? Well, we'd rearrange these or we'd think about, okay, I'll cross off the lowest, cross off the highest, cross off the next highest, the next lowest, and now I'm left with one middle value, which is my median, right? 50% of the observations are above that value, 50% of the observations are below it. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, so just kind of reviewing some things just to make these a little bit easier, honestly. I just wanted to make sure I point out some of the pitfalls, ways you can rule out certain answers. And that's, you know, one thing just as advice for the exam, especially on the multiple choice, like just always think about the principles of what the statistic you're looking for is. Like before you even go into it, just think about where it's bounded, right? If I am asked for a variance or a standard deviation, the first thing I should do just to make the problem easier, look and see, and I don't think it's on practice exam, I think practice exam B has this, excuse me. But if I look here, oh, maybe not, it's not on the variance, but it's on like the weighted, uh, you know, if I'm asked like down here for a standard deviation or a variance, right away, if I look down at the answers and I see a negative value, just cross that, uh, like in your mind, I guess you can't like cross it off on the screen, but you know, like in your mind, eliminate that right away. Um, or, you know, you're finding a probability, anything that's negative or anything that's above one, automatically, you know, that can't be an answer, right? 
So that way, like, even if you're having problems with a question, at least you've limited it down to where you can take a, a kind of better guess. You know, I, I hope you aren't guessing on any of them, but, you know, I'm being realistic. That could happen. Like, you can get stuck on an exam. So, so you know, I'm just kind of pointing out, really think about what you're looking for. And we, we talked through a little bit, too, about, you know, when we're thinking about these binomial examples, right? If the average is 50, and I ask you, well, what's the probability that you see zero? In your head automatically, you know, this should be very, very close to zero, right? It's very far away from the average, um, you know, or, or something closer to the average, right? Well, you know that it shouldn't have a probability that is really, really close to zero. So um, things like that, like remember, like that's where your mind should first go when you read the problem of, okay, what do I know like about where this can be bounded? What, what do I know like I could rule out here? And then try to think about like finding the formula because if you don't and you just jump to the formula and you get lost in the computation and you make an error and you get, you know, negative something for a variance. Okay, I got the answer. You're so far removed from what the original thing you were trying to look for is that you don't think about, oh, that answer doesn't make any sense, right? So that, that's another, you know, one thing I would kind of suggest when you're, when you're going through this exam, working on these problems. Um, really review the, the binomial and the Poisson. You know, think about that discussion of, that we had you know, earlier today about kind of when to identify the difference between the two, some of the properties of like zero factorial, using the complement rule on those problems. Um, any other questions for me about the exam or, or, or anything or any particular questions? Anybody on the, on the Zoom? Like I said, it might be a little bit shorter today. Um, I, I, there, you know, I think these will be some helpful things to remember that I said. Uh, anything that we really covered in class, any problem that I, I worked through, especially like some of the stuff I talked about today, I probably did it for a reason, right? Probably means that it's a good thing to know going into the exam. And I, I would kind of know since I wrote it, right? Okay. Well, uh, I will be uh, as available as I can be kind of, the, you know, this evening and, and, and this weekend. I'll check my email periodically if you have any last minute questions as you're studying. I may not be able to respond immediately, especially if, you know, you email me at 11 o'clock tonight or something. But I will try to get back to you periodically as, as quick as I can uh, as you're kind of doing last minute studying or kind of last minute preparation. Okay. All right. Well, good luck. Um, and I will see you guys on uh, Monday.